Good morning, everyone, and welcome to webinar number six for Safe Work Month. Today's presentation is on health and safety representatives under the Work Health and Safety Act. Today's presenters will be Sarah Gostello, Project Officer for WHS Legislation, Kathy Manios, Inspector for WorkSafe, Bill Mitchell, General Manager, WHS Legislation, and Andrew Stanbury, Inspector of Mines. The Department of Mines, Industry Regulation and Safety would like to pay its respects to the traditional custodians of this land on which we meet today and its elders, both past, present and emerging. Uh, so today we'll be discussing health and safety representatives under the WHS laws. There will be further Safe Work Month webinars on asbestos and licensing and authorizations. A schedule will be included at the end of the presentation. In Section 4 of the WHS Act, health and safety representatives are defined in relation to a worker as the health and safety representative elected under Part 5 of the Act for the work group of which the worker is a member. A worker may ask the PCBU to hold an election for one or more HSRs to represent workers who carry out work for the business or undertaking. If the PCBU receives such a request, they must facilitate the determination of one or more work groups of workers. A work group may include more than one workplace and is usually a group of workers who share a similar work situation. A work group is to be determined by negotiation and agreement between the PCBU and the workers who will form the work group or their representatives. The PCBU should take all reasonable steps to commence negotiations within 14 days of receiving a request to elect HSRs. The parties to an agreement may, at any time, negotiate a variation of the agreement, for instance, to change the size or membership of the work group. The PCBU must, as soon as practicable, notify workers of the outcome of the negotiation or variation of an agreement. If requested by a worker, the PCBU must negotiate with the worker's HSR in negotiations under this section. If negotiations fail, any party to the negotiations may ask the regulator to appoint an inspector to decide the matter. The eligibility requirements for election as an HSR of a work group are that the worker has to be a member of the work group and must not be disqualified under Section 65 from being an HSR. The process for conducting an election, including whether assistance of a union is necessary, is determined by the work group and the PCBU must provide any resources, facilities, and assistance that are reasonably necessary to enable the elections to be conducted. All workers in the work group are entitled to vote. An HSR holds office for three years compared to two years under the OSH Act, unless they resign by written notice given to the PCBU, cease to be a worker in that work group, are disqualified under Section 65, or are removed from that position by a majority of the members of the work group in accordance with the WHS regulations. For those who are already appointed as safety and health reps under the OSH Act, when the new laws come into effect, those with less than 12 months remaining in their term will serve out their remaining term. For those whose remaining term is greater than 12 months, the term of office expires 12 months from the commencement date of the WHS Act. HSRs are eligible for re-election, and deputy HSRs, who are elected in the same manner as HSRs, can exercise the same powers and functions if the main HSR is unable to or has ceased to hold office. The regulator may make an application to the tribunal to disqualify an HSR for a specified time or indefinitely because they exercised a power or performed a function as an HSR for an improper purpose, or they used or disclosed any information that they acquired as an HSR for a purpose other than in connection with the role of an HSR. Any person adversely affected by those actions may also make an application to the tribunal. An HSR is not personally liable for acts or omissions done or reasonably believed to have been done in good faith in performing their functions under this act. The OSH and WHS Acts are broadly consistent in relation to powers and functions of HSRs. Their functions include, for example, 
representing the workers in the work group in matters relating to work health and safety, and monitoring the measures taken by the PCBU in compliance with this act. In carrying out those functions, HSRs may inspect a workplace at any time after giving reasonable notice to the PCBU, or at any time without notice if there is an incident or situation that poses a serious risk. They can accompany an inspector during a workplace inspection and be present at interviews concerning work health and safety matters between a worker or group of workers and an inspector or PCBU. They can also request the establishment of a health and safety committee and receive information about the health and safety of workers in the work group. Now that does not include personal or medical information which identifies the worker without the worker's consent. An HSR can exercise these powers in relation to matters that affect workers in their relevant work group, unless there is a serious risk to health or safety in other work groups and the HSR or deputy HSR for that work group is unavailable. A PCBU must, so far as reasonably practicable, consult and confer with HSRs on WHS matters and for the purpose of ensuring that the health and safety of workers in the work group. They must allow access and provide resources to HSRs to enable them to carry out their aforementioned functions, for example, allowing access to information about hazards, allowing them to attend interviews or inspections, etc. Training courses for HSRs will be approved by the Work Health and Safety Commission under the WHS Act. The existing Commission for Occupational Health and Safety has agreed to endorse a model for HSR training based upon the principles, learning objectives, and processes employed in other Australian jurisdictions which have implemented the harmonized WHS leg legislation. The Commission will review how this work progresses down the track. A new provision in the WHS Act allows HSRs to choose which WHS course to attend. The PCBU cannot refuse the HSR attending the course, and the PCBU must pay the course costs plus reasonable expenses. There is no additional prescribed training required. When HSRs represent a work group which carries out work for two or more PCBUs, the cost of the HSR performing their functions should be split equally between the PCBUs unless otherwise agreed. PCBUs are not required to notify WorkSafe of HSR appointments, but they must keep a list and display it at the main place of business or any other workplace based on work groups. A PCBU must establish a health and safety committee within two months after the day on which they are requested to do so by an HSR or five or more workers at that workplace, or if required to do so by the regulations. The constitution of the committee may be agreed between the PCBU and the workers and may include, for example, one or more HSRs and one or more representatives of the PCBU but at least half of its membership must be workers who are not nominated by the PCBU. If agreement cannot be reached, any party may request that the regulator appoint an inspector to decide the matter. The functions of a health and safety committee are to facilitate cooperation between the PCBU and workers in instigating, developing, and carrying out measures to ensure worker safety, developing WHS standards, rules and procedures, and any other function prescribed by the regulations or agreed between the PCBU and the committee. The committee should meet at least once every three months or at any reasonable time at the request of at least half of its members. And like an HSR, the PCBU must allow each member of the committee to spend the time that is reasonably necessary to attend meetings and perform the functions of the committee allow them access to information, and pay members what they would otherwise be entitled to receive for performing their normal duties during that period. Where a WHS matter arises in the workplace, parties must make reasonable efforts to achieve a timely, final, and effective resolution. If reasonable efforts fail, any party may request that the regulator appoint an inspector to resolve the issue. The inspector must make a decision within two days of the request. 
A worker may cease or refuse to carry out work if they have a reasonable concern that carrying out the work would expose themselves or another person to a serious health or safety risk. A new power under the WHS Act enables HSRs to direct that unsafe work cease. This may happen if the HSR has a reasonable concern that continuing the work would expose a work group member to a serious risk to their health or safety. An HSR may issue a provisional improvement notice if they reasonably believe that a person is contravening, has contravened, and is likely to continue to contravene the WHS Act, provided that they have consulted with the person first. An HSR cannot issue a provisional improvement notice where an inspector has already issued or decided not to issue an improvement or prohibition notice in relation to the same matter. An HSR can only direct that unsafe work cease or issue a PIN if they have completed the approved training. Anti-discrimination provisions in the WHS Act protects workers, prospective workers, and others who perform safety-related functions or activities under the WHS Act. Discriminatory conduct includes dismissing or refusing to engage a worker or terminating a contract for services with the worker. Offences may be prosecuted by the regulator, or alternatively, an affected person or their representative may apply to the Work Health and Safety Tribunal for a civil remedy. So that completes the presentation component of today's webinar. Thank you for listening. Um, and we'll now move to the Q&A portion. Uh, you can participate by going to slido.com and entering the event code. We welcome the opportunity to answer your questions. Yeah, thank you and, uh, and welcome. Um, the first question we've received is, will existing reps have the power to direct the cessation of work without attending further training? Okay, um, so pursuant to section 400 subsection B of the WHS Act, um, safety and health representatives who are elected under the OSH Act will still be able to perform their functions and powers um, under the repealed act until the uh, conclusion of the term or the expiration of their, their original term. Um, however, the power to direct the cessation of work is not a power of function that was under the OSH Act. It is a new power under the WHS Act. And so the WHS Act actually specifically provides that a safety and health rep cannot uh, direct the cessation of work unless they have completed the approved training. So the, the short answer is, is no, unless they've actually com completed the approved training. Thank you. The next question is, along similar lines, will existing reps who are returning for subsequent terms be required to complete refresher training? Um, if they are coming back to complete uh, to, um, for a subsequent term, then yes, they will have to um, complete the approved training um, under the Work Health and Safety Act, which is going to be determined by the Work Health and Safety Commission. Yes. And they'll also need to do that because um, if they want to issue um, a cessation of work as well, so that's, that's required there. As an HSR, how am I meant to write or issue pins without detailed legislation? Can I write them for contravening against safety case? If so, who reviews? Okay. Um, so, firstly, the WHS laws will be published um, and will be available to be viewed and for people to familiarize themselves with the detail um, of the new legislation. Um, arguably, the WHS laws are more prescriptive than the OSH laws, um, and the processes and requirements for issuing a PIN are outlined there, and so a a health and safety rep would identify that an issue uh, has occurred in the workplace, a, a legislated deficit. Um, they would consult with the work group and then they would write and issue a PIN um, consistent with the requirements in the WHS Act. Um, specifically in relation to petroleum and geothermal energy operations and safety case, um, the PAGEO regulations um, as far as I'm aware, don't reference PINs. Um, but there is a provision in the PAGEO regs that compliance um, with the safety case is required. 
And so failure to comply with a commitment in the safety case would be something against which you would write and issue a pin. Um, and then insofar as having them reviewed, again, because it's captured by the WHS Act, it would be very much the same for general workplaces as it would be for um, PAGEO workplaces. Does that make sense? Is there anything that I've, is there anything else that you'd like to add? <laughs> to I was going to say, this is a really good opportunity to, uh, because you've asked out who would review the, um, the pins. Um, it particularly provides for uh, inspectors to, to review the pins and the next question relates um, very much to um, our two colleagues from the inspectorate. As, inspectorate will, as inspectors, will there be any difference in your approach to safety and health reps and pins under the work health and safety laws? And perhaps Andrew, if you might like to respond. Um, short answer, no. Um, essentially, our role is to um, work with the, uh, the safety and health reps to you know, facilitate that safe workplace and that fundamentally doesn't change. Um, the, the processes, the technical processes may be slightly different, but our approach to the way we work and the way we support, and that's a very important principle, the way we support the health and safety reps, um, I think will be exactly as they are now. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'm in, I'm in agreement with Andrew, uh, as long as they can show that they've consulted and cooperated. Mm. Uh, on the WHS matter, uh, clearly to the inspector, and that those avenues have exhausted, and then as a regulator, we can go out. Uh, but they do need to show that consultation has taken place. Okay, um, the next question is, currently the rep training provider needs to give a certificate three work health and safety units on scope aligned to the course. Will this continue to be a requirement. I think, um, as Sarah mentioned earlier on in her presentation, the Commission is considering the course and uh, at this stage they've made an in principle decision that um, the uh, national course will be adopted in Western Australia. Um, the process is still going on to finalise the arrangements for that. Um, we are acutely aware of uh, the very narrow timelines we have available and we'll be trying to resolve those issues as quickly as, um, as possible. Um, our expectation is that uh, the Commission will be writing to um, RTOs in the very near future explaining um, about the training course, but there's still some decisions to be resolved um, in relation to finalising that course, um, and um, that will involve some discussions with our colleagues in the Eastern States. Will existing reps be required to attend transitional training in the work health and safety legislation as was the case when the OSH Act was amended in 2005. So in 2005 there was a particular course that was developed. Um, there is no transition course um, available so the answer directly to the question is no. However we will be providing information um, on the website uh, once the Commission has made its decision in relation to the work health and safety laws and the adoption of the training course. So the next question is, for the companies that have safety coordinators, administrators, are they required to have safety representatives? Mm. So um, as Sarah mentioned in her presentation, um, and as is the, the current arrangement, there needs to be negotiation between the workplace. Um, so there's no particular role for um, officials within a um, an organisation, but it requires that the uh, organisation internally um, discusses and comes to some sort of agreement about the role they see for safety and health representatives. The next question is, will there be a requirement to notify demurs of a rep being elected? Has the requirement been removed? Uh, there is no requirement for, um, for a PCBU to notify of the election of um, health and safety rep. Uh, the only requirement is that they must keep a list um, and display it at the workplace. So uh, introduction or information packs and cards, etc., will not be sent out to um, health and safety reps. So why do health and safety reps need training as per the Act, but internally employed with the PCBU, safety advisor managers do not? So the, in relation to that, of course, the health and safety reps are representatives of the workers at the workplace. 
and um, the government has decided, or parliament has decided, that um, in view of their particular role, that they should be provided with certain um, with certain training to help them undertake that role. In terms of the uh, appointments by the PCBU, presumably the PCBU will be training those particular representatives in terms of their um, roles in, to make workplaces safe. Um, so it doesn't necessarily matter what role you have, um, there, is a ro there is an obligation on the uh, PCB to make sure you're trained, but in terms of the safety and health reps, it's a way of the government making sure that um, you are aware of your, you are properly trained with regard to your powers so that you can be as effective as possible in terms of uh, helping make the workplace safe. Bill, I think, um, if I can pick up from that sure. too, I think um, if, if you embrace the, um, the spirit of the new legislation um, and the fact that consultation and work within the, within the organisation is so important um, and really the, the health and safety reps are an asset of the organisation too, so that training is an investment in that asset, I think. Uh, someone's just um, clarified the answer for us as well. It's uh, the person who said workers may request the training, so there's no obligation to necessarily have uh, the training. Yeah, that's quite right. But as uh, we mentioned earlier, if you want to exercise some of the power in relation to pins and um, the cessation of work, you need to be trained for that. Can more than one health and safety rep represent one work group, like three HSRs in one work group? Um, absolutely. So there, I don't believe that there was actually a limit. It's however many um, HSRs. Um, you can have a number of HSRs elected by workers, by PCBUs. I think the only requirement was that at least half of its membership should be um, uh, people who are nominated by someone other than a PCBU. But there aren't any limits on how many HSRs can, or deputy HSRs can um, represent a workplace. So the health and safety reps reported to a particular work group. There is authority in the Act for another work group if, for example, for example, their health and safety rep is either not available or um, for whatever reason, they can ask um, a health and safety rep from another group to come along and give them a hand sort out the um, health and safety issues within their work group. Will the deputy reps be required to attend the accredited five-day rep course? So. Um, if similarly with the uh, health and safety reps, if they want to um, um, have the full authority, the full powers, etc., they need to do that five-day uh, that five-day course. Um, the next question is: How does the vaccine mandate impact the work health and safety requirements of a business? So the vaccine mandate is something that's been imposed by uh, the government. Um, and it's not necessarily imposed under the work health and safety laws. Um, mm. But of course there is the option that um, um, some uh, workplaces may determine for uh, under general safety duties that, the vac that uh, people may require vaccines. Well that's a matter, different matter. But in terms of the government's commitment and, and its mandate, that's not something that falls within the work health and safety laws. Um, but if the government has has issued that uh, requirement, um, well, my belief would be that uh, you would be required to comply with that, that particular requirement. The next question is, can a manager supervisor be a rep? So the work health and safety laws talk about um, workers. I guess if the, um, if the workplace wanted to um, elect a manager as a, as a representative, they could do that. I'm sorry, I just can't recall off the top of my head whether um, it's necessarily restricted to a worker, but in some places a manager can be a worker as well. So I suspect if the workers wanted a manager to be um, their safety and health rep, there wouldn't be anything that would stop them. There's um, not 100%. Bill, I, th I, th I, th I yeah, hit the nail on the head there. I think um, the fact that the workers are going to um, elect the health and safety rep and also within the health and safety committee too that balance that um, half of them um, need to be elected by somebody else other than the um, 
PCBU. So um, I think the balance will be maintained, and even if a manager does want to be a health and safety rep, they've got a good I on them if they do. There was a reference about an officer that can't. Yes. So uh, we, yes, we're getting uh, so officers uh, managers are not necessarily, in fact, generally speaking, it would be unlikely that officers were uh, sorry managers were officers for the work health and safety laws. That's really the senior executives mm. within an agency. Is there a minimum number of people required to form a committee? Uh, not that I recall. No, I, I, once again, the numbers of the committee are formed, uh, are resolved through um, consultation. I'm sorry, I just can't recall the particular section in the Work Health and Safety Act. But if you have a look at the section, it really is quite clear, um, uh, the requirements are spelled out quite clearly. Um, and that legislation is available through the Work Health and Safety website. Or alternatively, if you go to the government legislation, you can access the Work Health and Safety Act, it is published on that, uh, that website. What guidance notes will be provided to replace the formal consultative processes, guidance notes that currently exists? So the, uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, the department is working on guidance material um, and we'll be looking to get that uh, material finalised um, as soon as, uh, as possible but there are still some matters in relation to the reg regulations and also the, um, the course which need to be finalised. So as you'll appreciate to commence the work health and safety laws, there's a large number of documents that need to be, be prepared um, and we will be doing our best to get as much information as possible out for uh, safety and health reps and RTOs as soon as possible. Is disclosure of information for improper purpose inclusive of when a rep uses information gathered for safety union purposes, purposes where they are a dual rep? I'm not sure I understand that, but I think um, you've talked about improper purpose. The um, work health and safety laws are quite clear about um, the availability of any information that you, uh, that you should have that you can have access to. So um, in, if you've done something that is improper, particularly when it comes to personal, person's private information, I, uh, I would think there would be some issues, uh, issues there. Um, and in terms of uh, union representatives, um, I, I'm sorry, I don't know enough about um, those laws, but as I say, um, the premise of the question talks about improper per, improper per Improper purpose, improper purpose, got it. Um, so I would be saying that if uh, there are any concerns, there's likely to be some issues raised with, uh, with demurs. The most, uh, sorry, the next question. Most sites say any worker can cease unsafe work. Mm. How is an HSR, how is an HSR, HSR power different? Oh, I'll keep going. Um, <laughs> so um, if um, uh, sites provide that, obviously the workplace has recognised that there's a general duty and I would assume there'd be some instruction. What this does is that, um, uh, what the work health and safety regulations do is it allow an HSR to make that decision even if they don't have the authority at the workplace. However, in making that particular decision, the HSR must still consult with the, with the PCBU. Um, and that's a requirement. So yes, um, as I say, it formalises the particular authority and obviously extends it to uh, workplaces that may not necessarily um, have provided the authority in the first place. I think, Bill, it's really important that people um, understand that that's a separate thing from the general duty to be able to stop work, which everyone has. As, as a cornerstone of, 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 the, um, of the legislation. If an HSR directs cessation of work, which results in significant business loss, and this was subsequently shown to be unnecessary, what can the PCBD, PCBU do? So, um, as I mentioned uh, in response to the previous question, there's obviously a need for the PCBU and, or for the HSR to talk to the PCBU mm. and ideally come to um, an agreement. Um, during Sarah's presentation she mentioned that um, when HSRs are acting in the best interests of all parties concerned, 
um, they have no personal liability. Mm. Um, so it's in the interest of the, uh, the PCBU and the worker to resolve the issue ideally. Um, and of course, if there are any concerns, um, contact can be made with, uh, with Demers. Where the rep requests training that is significantly more costly than equivalent approved training from another provider, is there provision for the employer? So, um, as Sarah mentioned during her presentation, the, um, uh, the health and safety rep can choose the course, but um, if there are any unreasonable costs associated with that particular course, the PCBU doesn't have to, to meet that course. So the example I'll give is, let's say there is a, a health and safety rep course in Kununurra that uh, the health and safety rep can attend, um, and there's also an equivalent of course in, in Perth. Obviously there's some, some substantial costs for the employer in terms of uh, travel and accommodation arrangements down in Perth. Because the course is available in Kununurra, um, it would be unreasonable for the uh, employer to be expected to pay for the full cost for the health and safety rep to go down to Perth. If the health and safety rep nevertheless wanted to do that, um, the um, em employer would be expected to cover the cost of the course, but the accommodation and travel arrangements, they would be at the HSR's expense. Bill, um, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong too, but the course is going to be approved anyway. so regardless of which course you're picking, they, 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 there's not going to be a lot of difference between them. Correct, yes, so the, that's right. Um, can contractors who work within a workplace be a rep? So in relation to um, uh, workplaces, is that, uh, yeah. so we talked about work groups rather than workplace, but um, contractors can be if the... Um, if the work group, as they are, decide they want to nominate a particular contractor to be on that, um, in that work group. And that's one of the good things about the work health and safety laws. Um, it is inclusive and it does recognise um, that um, some contractors uh, may be working alongside permanent employees and they may be there for, for quite some time. So uh, the short answer is yes. Similar to a previous question, sorry, similar to a previous answer, can a health and safety rep issue pins against the M Mine Safety Management System, MSS, MSMS, non-compliance, also if they have had the approved training? So I would think that in relation to um, the pin, it would be issued in relation to a particular um, safety issue at the workplace. And clearly the Mine Safety Management System should address that issue, but if it doesn't, and there's a particular safety issue, um, a pin can be issued. Mm. And my mining inspector's nodding his head, so I assume. Absolutely. Uh, great. Absolutely. Um, the next question Can committees have workers who are not HSRs? So the requirements in relation to the committee is that there is one, if there are HSRs, um, one of the eight, and there's more than one. Um, one can sit on the committee if that's the, if that's the uh, collective decision, or more for that matter, I think. Um, but it is quite clear in the work health and safety regulations when it talks about committees, the process for determining uh, committee members. Um, so, there are, so if there is an HSR, there is, needs to be at least one, but of course other workers can be on the committee as well as um, an appropriate um, representative of, or representatives of the PCBU involved. Um, what is the purpose of a, sorry, uh, I've pressed the wrong button. Sorry, bear with me. Uh, sorry, Jerome, if you're listening, I need a hand here. <laughs> I can't see what it is. Your own down here, mate. Down here. <laughs> so 
So I'm sorry about this. I've just pressed the wrong button. I don't have the expertise to... <laughs>
something that's imminent that could cause uh, serious injury or harm, then there could be a prohibition. Uh, but yeah, we, we will definitely action that. We're there to help. I think the main thing is just um, getting back to the consultation and, and working mm -hmm. with, with, well. the, uh, with the uh, employer and the workers and, and trying to resolve it rather than escalating and, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, definitely. Oh, well, I'm saying when all consultation has exhausted. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. yeah. What happens if an HSR is unable to undertake duties such as, as attend meetings, undertake inspe inspections, etc.? Should they ask to be resign? Should they be asked to resign as an HSR? So, the purpose of um, first of all, the HSR is in fact elected by the uh, by the workers at the workforce at the workplace or in the work group. So clearly, there's an expectation that um, at the time of election, the health and safety rep is committed to to the task. So, um, if the work if the HSR is not attending and not doing their duties as are required. There is authority under the Work Health and Safety Act for workers at the workplace to take action to have that health and safety rep, uh, health and safety representative um, removed. Have, if there are issues with the health and safety rep not doing their jobs, it doesn't matter. There is still the option for workers to engage with the, uh, the PCBU and the managers, etc., to ensure the safety of the the workplaces. So the, HS, the HSRs are of course there to help the workplace, but there's nothing stopping other members of the workplace from undertaking initiatives to ensure the workplace is safe. I guess, the, I guess the, Bill, there'd be two reasons why the, uh, the HSR wouldn't be fulfilling their duties, either because they're unable to, because of their circumstances, but possibly in other circumstances they weren't permitted to. So those are two very different scenarios too, I think. Mm. And, and the processes for them are different. Mm. That's right. So the next one is an HSR trained in, say, New South Wales, will they be recognised in WA? Well, as um, Sarah mentioned in her presentation, um, the Commission is looking to adopt the work health and safety training that is provided in other jurisdictions. And um, New South Wales, uh, in particular, the training developed by by New South Wales is likely to be that model. At this stage, we're not sure of what the uh, final outcome um, will be. And I'm sorry, I just can't recall the precise um, prescription in the Work Health and Safety Act, but I, sus I suspect not, but I'm not sure. But as I say, there'll be something in the Act there, and I guess we can clarify that with the guidance material um, once um, the decision about the course is finalised. Can casual workers who only work a few hours a week still be a rep? They are still technically, technically a worker in that work group. Well, yes, because um, the definition of worker is broad enough that it actually encompasses mm -hmm. casual workers, labour hire workers, subcontractors, etc. So arguably, yes. Yeah. What if Comcare is also our insurer and they provide a separate list of RTOs approved for delivering the course, and these are not the same as your list. So, um, un with Comcare, you're probably um, um, involved. They're sorry, they're a self-insurer. So, um, I'm not sure of the answer on that, but I suspect that um, if they are Comcare, that they're not within the jurisdiction of the Work they're Health not. and Safety Act. They're not. Currently, they're not either. No, so I, I don't think that uh, there's any consequence that, uh, for that, but we will check and obviously, up, um, with the guidance material, we'll endeavour to clarify that. Should reps be remunerated additionally via allowances for their HSR duties? Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no provision in the WHS Act that says anything about remuneration of HSRs. The only thing it says is that they should be paid um, what they would ordinarily be entitled to um, if they were carrying out their normal functions. Um, I suppose if there's anything about additional remuneration, that's really a business decision between... They should be disadvantaged. Yeah. Yes. Yep. That's, that's right. Yep. So the regulations are quite clear that they should be... Effectively, their existing pay should be maintained. What happens if the newly appointed rep cannot attend training within 
three months. So there's still the option for them to um, attend the course, but that's a that's a requirement on the PCBU. But clearly, if the rep can't attend, um, the um, the workplace should consider the role of the work, the rep. The rep can still do their functions, but they just can't issue pins or uh, order the cessation of work. So um, I would. It depends upon the reasoning, of course. Um, the employer can't prevent the rep from doing the, the course, um, but clearly if the rep, for whatever reason, doesn't want to attend the course, um, there's options within the workplace for the workers to um, take action to remedy that particular situation. I think possibly too, when the legislation comes into effect at the beginning of the year, um, there will probably be a bit of a flurry of people getting trained, so um, there might be a bit of a backlog there, so to speak, yes, for a while. That's right, but that's not the fault of the HSR or the no, or the PCBU. Not. Um, may HSRs attend inspections relevant to safety, e.g., electrical dangerous goods inspectors? So, in relation to the health and safety reps, uh, they relate to matters within the jurisdiction of the Health and Safety Act. Health and Safety Act. So things like dangerous goods, etc., that's not necessarily a matter for um, the Health and Safety, uh, Work Health and Safety Act. However, um, the Work Health and Safety re uh, laws do have jurisdictions in relation to general safety um, at workplaces. Um, so it depends upon the, uh, the issue at, at hand. But generally, if um, the workplace has a safety and health issue, um, for example, it might be in relation to um, 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 a building something. I don't, at building something, at, at the work health and safety laws would apply. So it just depends upon the nature of the issue. What obligations does the PCBU have to retain evidence of HSR registrations and committee meetings? A list. So that's something that can be determined by um, by consultation in terms if you want to record the meetings. Once again, I just can't recall offhand if there's anything there's prescribed. I don't, I don't think there was anything that was actually prescribed um, yeah. within the laws. So that'll be a matter for uh, the committee to determine um, when they're setting up, when they're coming to an agreement about the procedure and the particular requirements. Does it include the list they have to display? I'm not sure. How does an HSR show consultations taking place on a safety matter? Emails, phones, texts, WhatsApp. Um, so I guess what uh, you're looking for is in terms of the end of the road to justify um, whether, a, an in, presumably there'd be a question asked of an inspector. Well, um, the, the purpose of the health and safety reps in the first place is um, consultation at um, at the workplace. So, um, in terms of what might be uh, required, clearly you'll need to speak to the PCBU, but it will also depend upon the circumstances at a particular workplace. So, um, if there is an issue about consultation where a PC where a workplace cannot ag reach agreement, well, of course it'll come to um, um, my two colleagues here, and they will, of course. Uh, go to a workplace and speak to the people involved and form their own opinions about that. Would you like to add something to that? Yeah, generally, um, you're quite right, Bill. Those things do come up from time to time and um, we, we do help the, the workplace resolve those, even now under current legislation uh, where there's a, an, an issue around consultation. And, I mean, it's a, it's a brave new world with all the technology that we have now that helps facilitate that, uh, mm -hmm. that consultation and that working together on site. Will a snapshot summary of changes between OSH and work health and safety, safety and health rep requirements be provided to simplify the change in legislation requirements? The, um, once again, as Sarah mentioned, there's um, not that much difference between the work health and safety and the OSH representatives. It's still the same underlying principles. Yes, there are some changes, for example, the power to uh, direct the cessation of, of work. So there's not that much difference. Um, there will be um, 
um, guidance material that the department will prepare. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, it's in fact an enormous job um, and we'll be trying to cover off as many topics as we possibly can. Mm. Can a PCBU terminate an HSR's position for, f for failure to fulfil their obligations? The Work Health and Safety um, Act provides a process um, for the removal of HSRs, but that authority, if you like, uh, rests with the, uh, the workers. The uh, health and safety representative is uh, elected and determined by, um, by a ballot and the workers are the people who have the authority or have the power to erect a particular health and safety rep. So um, a PCBU cannot unilaterally terminate an HSR's position. Can workers remain anonymous with health and safety complaints if they fear discrimination? So this doesn't necessarily relate to health and safety representatives. Um, so um, the purpose of the health and safety representatives, of course, is consultation. So if a worker has a particular concern, they can approach their health and safety representative and, of course, ask that their name be um, kept confidential. Um, if a particular person wants to make a complaint with uh, with demurs, for example, because uh, there's no health and safety rep there or they can't resolve the dispute otherwise, um, demurs has a duty to maintain um, the anonymity of that particular uh, complainant. There are some particular disputes where it's more difficult than others, um, where there might, for example, be a very small number of work workers at a workplace, but generally, uh, but not generally, the, uh, uh, the inspectors um, are required not to divulge, mm. confirm or otherwise. Um, the identity and there are some other issues with your investigations about complaints etc so perhaps you'd like to expand Kat. Yeah, um, from the general workplace perspective uh, it would be lodged through the WorkSafe call centre where they'll get a reference number only if they give their name and don't and we don't divulge their details uh, and a contact but if they want to go fully anonymous they can go fully anonymous as well where we make it a generalised inspection uh, and touch on the points that they've listed in the reason for their complaint. Um, from a mind's perspective mm. too, it's, it's, in, it's something that's reared its head uh, many, many times in the sense that um, quite often we will get a, um, a complaint and under existing legislation, we can't divulge that person's details at all under any circumstances. Whereas I believe under the new OSH, the new WHS legislation, it can be divulged with their permission. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, for instance, if you're doing an investigation on Big Mine, if you can't tell, if you can't give those details to the employer, sometimes it's very hard for them to do an investigation that you've asked for. Mm. So this is a title HSR Union Rep, Rep question. Is information gathered during safety investigation then fair game to be used by same rep in their union role against an employer. So in terms of an investigation, um, these are conducted by um, uh, Demers investigators and the details of those investigations are, um, are confidential uh, during, the investigation, um, during the investigation process. In terms of information that uh, might be gathered during an, an inspection by, an, by a health and safety representative, the purpose of the, um, and this is just a general inspection if you like, the purpose of that inspection um, is to address health and safety representative, uh, sorry, health and safety issues at the workplace, prevent issues if they can. Um, so it's not meant to be an adversarial process. Clearly if no agreement can be reached, as I've mentioned a couple of times, um, demurs can be contacted and the regulator can inspect a ask an inspector mm -hmm. um, to go and attend the workplace. So at the end of the day, the issue will be resolved and there'll be full disclosure to the inspectors as they make their particular uh, decision. So just before we go on to the next question, I'd just like to say we're coming to the end of our presentation. Um, there's still opportunity for questions to be asked and we will endeavour to finalise or get to all of the answers before our time, but if not, um, we will endeavour to provide some guidance material uh, as well. 
I have found that the site I am on as a contractor, when there is an issue, the site supervisors go straight to my supervisor and not myself as a safety um, rep. So um, I'm not sure what the, well the issue is you're not being involved and they should be report. there is an obligation on the PCBU to um, provide information um, provide information to you about safety issues. Mm. Um, so I would, in the first instance, I would certainly be going to um, the site supervisor because you've been appointed by your working colleagues to be the, um, the, the representative. And I would suggest if you're not satisfied with that and the issues aren't being resolved to your satisfaction, once again, if you can't resolve it through your internal consultation processes, ideally if there's a health and safety committee there, um, you can certainly come to uh, Demers and we'll see what we can sort out for you. Um, if the workers do not request an HSR, is it a legal requirement for the workplace to have either a health and safety rep or establish a safety committee? So both of those things are at the discretion of the workers. Um, in terms of the health and safety committee, of course, there is the option under the, re under the work health and safety laws for the PCBU to establish a health and safety committee. Um, it's not necessarily dependent on an approach from, uh, from the workers. If the workers do not request an HSR, is it a legal requirement for a workplace to have either the HSR or, uh, HSR or establish, I think I've already answered that. Just Can an HSR or a worker representative take a dispute with the PCBU to the, uh, to the tribunal. So in the first instance, if there is an issue about safety at the workplace, um, as I mentioned earlier, it should be resolved at the workplace. If it can't be resolved, um, the workplace inspectors uh, can, be, um, uh, can be invited onto the workplace. If at the end of the day, the issue can't be resolved, if for example, the inspector issues an improvement notice and there is a disagreement, there is an internal review process which can be uh, conducted within Demers, and at the end of the day, if you're still unhappy, um, that particular um, action or decision by the uh, inspector can be reviewed uh, by the Work Health and Safety uh, Tribunal. Can I jump in with that one too, Bill? Um, and I guess from um, your perspective too, our absolute preference, even if we are contacted because I can't resolve things on site, is for us to act more as a facilitator than to go down there and lay down the law. We've got a whole bunch, we've got a whole lot of tools in our toolbox to do those, as, as you referred to, Bill, but at the end of the day, if the site can resolve the issues with their people, with the workers, with management, um, that's a far more sustainable process than, um, yes. than um, us making a determination. Um, why do we no longer have to register HSRs with Demers? Um, I think very early on we made a comment that this is the National Work Health and Safety Laws and this is not a requirement in those, uh, those laws. We understand that there are advantages in terms of registering um, health and safety reps with DEMERS but um, that's not a current uh, requirement so it's consistent with the National Work Health and Safety Laws. We've got one minute left. Um, what is the real difference between a deputy and full HSR if the deputy is not trained? Well, I think I answered that earlier on in terms of if the deputy health and safety rep is, tr um, um, in order for the health and safety rep to um, provide full services, they need to be trained. Um, and in order to keep up to date with what's happening about the work health and safety implementation, uh, as you can see on your screen, there's some contact details there um, and we will be, we will be providing um, all of the information we can on those various um, social media options. So uh, we would like to take this opportunity for thanking you for your attendance today. And um, if you have any further questions, by all means make use of the um, the social media options. Thank you.